Hi, let's talk about the magnetic field due to a wire. And I'm going to try and motivate the theory for this uh, in analogy to what we talked about with electric fields. So if you remember, um, back in chapter 21 or something, so let's uh, think back to electric fields when we were talking about electrostatics. Uh, we started with Coulomb's law. We said, you know, E looks like KQ over R squared. And uh, we built upon this um, that uh, you know, this was talking about point charges, and then we said, okay, we can also, uh, if you have like a distribution of charge, you can find the electric field by integrating some differential electric field. And what this looked like was very similar to Coulomb's law. So it was, imagine, you know, a little um, differential charge uh, but it was also proportional to 1 over r squared. So basically, if you add it up, if we added up all the contributions from little um, differential charges, uh, we could uh, come up with the uh, net electric field due to some distribution of charge. And this, we kind of rationalized this, like building up from point charges to distributions of charge. And then eventually we introduced, you know, a better tool because it was kind of tedious sometimes to calculate this, to, do, to actually do this integral, um, uh, depending on the geometry. And so eventually we, can, we were able to get the electric field with a better tool, and that was uh, Gauss's law. Okay, so now we're talking about magnetic fields. And we want to find, you know, what does the magnetic field look like? So this is complicated by the fact that there are no magnetic charges. And this is a big distinction between uh, thinking about electric fields and thinking about magnetic fields. And I'm going to put this in red uh, just to try and draw your attention to it. Um, there are no magnetic charges. You can't take a magnet and cut it up into a north and a south pole. You break a magnet in half, you have two little magnets. Uh, and you may, you'll hear about these referred to as monopoles. There are no magnetic charges or monopoles. Um, and so how do we do this? We need some, uh, uh, we need to know what the different, uh, the differential magnetic field contribution is. So I'm just going to state it for you, and then we'll do some work with it. And what this looks like is the following. So it's, you know, despite there not being uh, magnetic charges, we're going to assume that it has a similar form. So it looks like it's proportional to uh, a constant, it depends on the current. And then it's times this thing, dl cross r hat over r squared. And this is called the Osevart law. Um, and this thing looks kind of gross, but let's talk about the pieces here. So notice it looks similar to the differential electric field contribution from Coulomb's law in that it looks like 1 over r squared. Now it's magnetic field, so it's depending on the current. Uh, what does this cross product mean? So let's let's break that down a little bit. Imagine, uh, you know, we have some current. And 
and uh, we know that uh, due to a wire, you apply the right-hand rule, you would have magnetic field lines around this, so they would be coming out of the page on this side, and they would be going into the page on this side of the wire. Uh, and the differential length would be a little snippet uh, of length here. And R, so we're interested in, you know, the magnetic field, say, here. So R would be a vector that would point from that differential contribution to there. Um, and the unit vector R would just be a vector of length 1 that points in that direction. And so th what this depends on is the cross product. So it's going to depend on you know the angle between them. Um, and you know, thinking back to what the cross product looks like, you know that um, A cross B looks like you could do this in component form, or you could do it in this form, where it looks like uh, AB sine theta, where theta is the angle between them. So in other words, it's going to be max maximized when theta is 90 degrees, when these things are perpendicular. And this kind of jives with our uh, you know, our cartoon picture so far that we've talked about with the magnetic field, where if you have, um, you know, a wire, and just imagining a straight wire, and there's current flowing through it, you know that the magnetic field uh, would, you apply your right-hand rule, it's going to curve around this thing like this. Um, okay, so let's uh, actually integrate this differential magnetic field contribution. In other words, let's do this to find what the magnetic field would look like. Now we need to pick a geometry that will make this um, so that we can evaluate it. And oh, I would mention this is all uh, from section 28.6 in your textbook. Um, so the configuration that we want to look at is uh, just a straight wire. So let's derive the magnetic field from the straight wire uh, using this Bios of Art law. So, all right, the configuration that I want us to think about is just a straight wire. I'm going to draw it along X, and we're going to be interested in what's the magnetic field doing here. Um, and this is going to be some, uh, put our coordinate system here. And so this is some distance I'll write as capital R. Um, we're going to have a current that's flowing in the wire. Uh, and, you know, we're going to have some differential little length snippet of the wire uh, there, and then we need, you know, we're interested in, so this is R, R hat pointing like that, and, you know, deal uh, like that. I think that's all the ingredients that we need. Um, Oh, the angle. So in this geometry, we could put the angle theta there. Um, all right, so we know that the magnetic field is going to look like the integral of our differential contributions. So in this case, this is going to become an integral over x. Um, so let's uh, expand this a little bit. This will be the integral. of u naught i over 4 pi dl cross r. 
So in this uh, picture, let's put in what these pieces are going to be. So this is going to be over all x. So we're going to go from negative infinity to infinity. Um, dl is going to become dx. Uh, dl cross r hat, we can think of this as dl, the magnitude of dl, times the magnitude of r hat, which will be 1, times sine theta. So in other words, this will be sine theta dl, because this is 1. Um, and you know, furthermore, dl is going to be dx in this uh, geometry. OK. Um, what else do we need to know? Well, the other thing that we need is, uh, well, let's put those ingredients in and see what it starts to look like. So this becomes integral from negative infinity, infinity of, uh, oh, you know, I can pull this stuff out. Let's pull out the constants. Um, so our dl cross r is going to be sine theta times dx, or r squared. So then the next ingredient that we want is, notice this integral contains a bunch of different stuff. We have theta, but we're integrating over x, and we have r in here. So uh, the next thing, let's express those two pieces in terms of x. So notice uh, r. Um, r is the square root. We can use Pythagorean theorem. This will just be the square root of capital R squared plus y squared. Um, and, or sorry, not y squared, x squared. Uh, and then also notice that sine theta would be uh, just capital R over lowercase r. So this would just be capital R over x squared. So let's put those ingredients in. See what this thing looks like. So we would have our constants, mu naught i over 4 pi, uh, sine theta, so capital R over Um, times 1 over r squared. And then we're integrating over x. And, you know, we can consolidate this down. Notice this will be this integral that we saw before. Uh, in the context of finding the electric field due to a linear charge distribution. So we get this thing, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, not obvious integral of r squared plus x squared and the denominator raised to the three halves. And it turns out if you evaluate this, you know, you can look it up in a table or you can use a computer or whatever, or, you know, exercise your calculus skills. This uh, definite integral is just 2 over r. So this whole thing looks like mu naught i over 4 pi times 2 over r. In other words, the magnetic field due to a wire looks like mu naught i over 2 pi r, where r is the, the distance from the wire. And notice, you know, this is proportional to 1 over r. So it's sort of the safe, same functional dependence as the electric field due to a linear charge distribution. But this was definitely hard, right? We had an integral that we had to look up. Um, I would call this the hard way.
to calculate. And this was using the, you know, abuse of art, um, using this differential magnetic field contribution and adding them up due to this geometry. Um, and you can see how that's difficult, uh, but it's also a powerful technique because you could extend that to, you know, any geometry that you want, provided that you could do the integration. So, just like we did with the electric fields, we did it the hard way, now let's do it the easy way. So with regards to electric fields, the easy way was this new tool, Coulomb's Law. So the easy way uh, with regards to magnetic fields is Ampere's Law. And this you will find in section 28.4. Um, and let me state this for you. So that was the hard way, easy way. Uh, here's Ampere's Law for you. So notice this looks suspiciously like Gauss's Law for electrostatics. B dot DL is going to equal mu naught I enclosed. So what is this telling us? So we have this closed integral. Now instead of uh, a surface integral, like Gauss's law, this is a line integral. You're making a loop. So if you integrate uh, the magnetic field around a loop, you find that it is equal to uh, a constant times the uh, current enclosed by that loop. So qualitatively, if you have, um, well, yeah, if you have, imagine a current, um, and if you integrate around this loop, let me actually draw this um, from the top. So the current is coming at us. Now, the magnetic field. I've been using blue for that sometimes here. The magnetic field would go around it. And notice, uh, if you're talking about what, so basically the game that you're doing here is just like with Gauss's law, where you pick a geometry that's favorable so that uh, the argument, in, you know, the stuff inside the integral is constant, and so that that dot product is uh, gives you one. What we do is we pick a circle that goes around uh, your current. If you do that, notice that this radius would be constant. So in other words, the the uh, magnitude of the magnetic field is going to be the same. And also, notice that DL and B are aligned. So the magnetic field is like this. Here, let me pick a spot and I'll just, you know, the magnetic field would be like that. And the differential little length would also be like that. In other words, DL is parallel to the magnetic field everywhere around that circle. And as a consequence, this uh, integral just becomes BDL. And since B is going to be constant at a given R, we can pull it out. And then this just becomes a line integral around DL around a circle what is that? Well, it's just the closed loop around a circle is the circumference of the circle. So this becomes 2 pi r equals mu naught i enclosed. And notice now we have our magnetic field back. This would look like mu naught i over 2 pi r. So this is the easy way to find the magnetic field using Ampere's law. 
And you can imagine applying this to different configurations. You can do things like find the magnetic field inside of a wire. Um, and we'll add some examples, but I'm just going to throw the theory at you here. Um, and just to kind of present it uh, in parallel to what we talked about with electric fields. So one application that immediately comes from this is the ability to calculate uh, now that we know what the, the magnetic field looks like, we can do things like calculate the force between wires uh, on account of the magnetic field. So let's look at that. And then we'll look at some uh, examples. So check this out. If we have wire, two wires that are Parallel, ugh, if I can draw a wire here. Parallel, and let's say they're separated by some distance d. And, you know, we have a current flowing in each of these wires. Thus far, we had talked, you know, qualitatively about this. That we could, for example, you know, apply the right-hand rule. You know that there would be a magnetic field that would be looping around this wire like that. In other words, it would be going into the page on this side and coming out of the page over here. Well, now we know the magnitude of that as a function of R. And what you can do is notice there would be magnetic field lines that would also be going uh, through this wire too. And they're perpendicular. And so if you were to apply your right-hand rule, uh, I cross B, I is pointing up, I2, B is pointed into the page. So there would be a force that would be pointing like this in this situation. And you could do this same uh, You could do this same procedure uh, by on, on current one on the first wire by finding the magnetic field due to the second wire, looking at it at um, the location of I1, and you would find that there would be a force that would be pointed like that in this case. So they're attracting each other. And it makes sense that they should be equal and opposite because of Newton's third law. Um, and but now, since we know what the magnitude of the magnetic field looks like, that we have that function, we can calculate what this would be. So the force, uh, recall from chapter 27, this looks like IL cross B. These are perpendicular if it's just two wires that are next to each other, if we're looking at the, um, the cross product. So this would become I1L or sorry, I2L, we're finding the magnetic field due to I1. So I2L times the magnetic field, which would be mu naught uh, I1 over 2 pi r. Now r in this case would be d. But that is the magnetic field, or sorry, that is the force between these wires due to the magnetic field interacting with the current in the other wire, or vice versa. Um, and, you know, we could extend this, too. It's kind of interesting to consider the case, uh, you know, what if instead of this case where we had, you know, the current going in, in the same direction, we can change the current direction. So if one is going up and one is going down, um, you know, keeping everything the same. The magnitude of the force would be the same, except, or recall, this would be the same situation. We would have the magnetic field lines uh, due to this one would be going, you know, into the page. I can't draw it very well. You know what I'm saying. It would be going in through that wire, uh, 
But now, when you do your right hand rule, I cross B, since I2 is pointing down, uh, the direction of the force is now, instead of pointing in, it's going to point out. And you could do the same on the other side, and you would find that they would be pointing away. So this scenario is equally applicable, um, and we can actually calculate it. So that's something that shows up in your homework, um, you know, finding the force between wires. So next, uh, we'll look at some more examples for some different geometries, uh, as well as build on this tool that we have, Ampere's Law, just like, and Biosavart for that matter, we'll look at some different geometries, but just like how um, once we had Gauss's Law, we could kind of look at different geometries and come up with what the electric field would look like, well, we can use uh, Ampere's Law to look at uh, the magnetic field for some different current configurations. Um, and that's where we're headed.